Hi everyone, welcome to week seven of Graduate Statistics, um, University of Cincinnati. I want to recap a little bit of what we've done last week. So last week you were introduced to probability distributions, in particular the normal distribution, which is a special uh, kind of distribution that everybody sees in statistical um, courses. And the reason the normal distribution um, is studied so much is because a lot of the variables that we study in psychology shows up with this probability distribution in the population. We looked at two examples. We looked at race times uh, for triathlon athletes of different sex and age groups. Those distribute normal, you know, those have a normal distribution in the population with means and variability that differ depending on whether you're looking at uh, male or female racers and whether you're looking at younger or older age groups but they showed this normal distribution and we also looked at GRE scores that also show up with a normal distribution in the population. So the first thing that I want to clarify is what role do these probability distributions play in the context of statistics? We explored last class one role that it plays, which is the statistician's way of representing the population with respect to a particular characteristic. So let me track back. When we all think of a population of individuals, we think of actual people or actual countries um, that have a particular characteristic, right? So let's say we're looking at GRE scores. So when we think about the population of uh, white females that take GRE scores, we imagine that there is a bunch of females that take GRE scores and that constitute the population, all of them with their own score in hand, right? And in fact, this is what it is. However, statisticians represent that population abstractly with a probability distribution of those scores. That is, that probability distribution tells us the probability of finding particular GRE scores in that particular population. In this case, we're talking about white females. So it's a way, a compact way of representing the population because a distribution has a particular center, a particular very frequent score, which is the mean, and also we, you know, the, the, the scores that deviate from the mean more and more will happen with less and less and less probabilities. And with that in hand, if you know how a particular variable is distributed in the population, you can then do what we did last class, which is to put a particular score that a person got in context. So let's think about this. I asked you to consider the score of two candidates to graduate school to help a faculty member decide who they should pick. So I said that they were, they, they, they were bound by some regulations in their department to use the GRE score. So that particular faculty member um, had two candidates she liked very, very much, one of whom was John, a, a white male, and one of whom was Leticia, a Hispanic female. The faculty member knew that there is a that, that the distribution of scores in the population is not the same for people of different races and different sex. So he she asked for help of a statistician to figure out uh, you know how to compare those scores. So John had a raw score that was higher than Leticia's score when they compared to each other just in, in the Roy scale, right? You looked at the number here, John's number was higher than Leticia's number. However, this is more complicated than that because if there is a bias in the test and uh, white males tend to score in general better than, than Hispanic females, you should not compare their scores directly to each other. You should put the scores in context first to then have a fair comparison. So this is one exercise you've done uh, for the independent activity, right? So what you did, you got 
the dis you understood you got data to understand how the GRE scores are distributed in the population of white males so that you could put John's score in context. So we had information about the population, about how GRE distributes in the population, that is, what's the probability of getting different scores. So we were able to take John's scores and say, here's how John performed with respect to his group. And now do the same for Leticia. But now we use the different probability distribution because the probability of the scores for her group is a little bit different, right? So we were able to find how she was ranked with respect to her own group. And then we found out that even though John's score, John's Roy score was higher than Leticia's Roy score, she actually performed better with respect to her group then he performed with respect to his group. So our recommendation was to admit Leticia because in the end, uh, when the biases in test scores were taken into account, she was the one that actually did better in the exam. So this is one use of probability distributions. It's a way of representing a population with respect to a particular characteristic. And then we can, if somebody else from that population has a score, we can interpret that score with respect to the full population. And we did this not only with GRE score, but we also um, did the same exercise with the triathlon race. Again, comparing the time a female and a male took for running directly, was not fair because they were competing with their own groups of people, right? So it's nice if we, if you, if you have information about the population to describe that um, um, and summarize that in a probability distribution so that you can see how you ranked with respect to that group. What is implied in all that I'm saying here is that for the exercises we've done last class, we had information about the population in, uh, with respect to the two characteristics we worked with, GRE scores and uh, race times. So we had information about the population that was represented by probability distributions that we knew the shape of, it was normal. We knew the, the center, we had the mean values and we had the standard deviation. With those things in hand, we were able to compute, um, to locate the scores that we're interested in um, with respect to those populations. A number of times, we do not have information about the population, and we want to use information that we have from a sample of individuals to figure out, to construct the probability distribution of that characteristic in the population. Does that make sense? Sometimes, for instance, I would like to know, um, maybe there is a new sport, maybe people are, or somebody developed a new test. Instead of GRE, somebody developed a whole new test called GEE. -E. And at the moment, I don't know, right, how the test, is, how people score on that test in the population. So I would have to take samples of individuals representative samples, representative random samples of individuals to construct um, the probability distribution that then would represent the population. So I'll draw the contrast again. Last time, we had in hand the probability distribution of GRE scores. Then we had the score of an individual, say John, a white male, that we wanted to compare with the scores of his own population. What's the probability of getting that score? How high is it? Is it typical, atypical, right? So because we had the probability distribution in the population, I could take that score and compare to it. Sometimes, however, what I wanna do is to get information about the population through a sample of individuals. So I sample a group of individuals to find out what's going on in their population to make inferences about what's going on in the population, right? So imagine I developed a whole new test, GEE -E, instead of GRE. 
And I have no idea how people do in, the, in that test, right? So I get, I want to know how white females doing that test. So I sample a group of people that represent that population. So I have a sample, multiple individuals, and I try to figure out from those individuals how the whole group performs. So that's statistical inference. I go from sample to the population. So what I try to do is, for instance, I make them all take the test and I can get the mean and say, oh, here is the mean score of the population based on the mean score I got in my sample. However, you do know by now that if I take multiple samples from the population, the mean will vary a little bit. That's called sampling error, right? And we played around with the idea of random experiment to demonstrate to you that that in fact happens, right? If you sample randomly from the, from the population of scores, you're going to get sometimes, let's say, a mean of 100, sometimes 110, sometimes 112, so on and so forth. So it would be nice if we could have an estimate, not only of the mean, but, you know, what's the margin of error that I can expect? What's the sampling variability that I can expect such that I can make, I can say, you know, from, from what I studied in my sample, I imagine that the mean for this population is 100 and with a margin of error of 2. Maybe it goes from 180, 108 to 112 with 95% of confidence, I can say that, right? So getting an estimate of this sampling variability is really, really important for statistical inference. It strengthens our statistical inference, right? So today I want to tell you how we go from sample data to constructing what is expected about the population using what we call the central limit theorem that you probably again heard of, but that's what I want you to understand what it is for. That's what it is for. When I get a sample and I wanna make inference about the population, I compute things in the sample and I wanna say with a particular level of confidence, what's the variation that I can expect due to sampling error, right? So we use things like confidence intervals to allow those inferences to be made from the sample to the population. You're basically helping construct the probability distribution of the population from a sample. All right. So now the other thing that we'll do with statistical inference is use the central limit theorem to construct probability distributions that will allow us to do hypothesis testing. So the two things that we'll do today, we'll continue to use probability distributions, but instead of assuming that we have one, that we know about one, we're going to learn how to use sample data to construct those uh, probability distributions and use them to make estimates about the population. Not only point estimates, but estimate the margin of error and also do some hypothesis testing. All right. So formal introduction today to those um, steps, important steps in statistical inference that we'll repeat over and over again until the end of the semester. So I'll see you in the next video uh, when we'll get started. All right, bye-bye.